Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live for October 21st, 2020. This is the School Committee and Superintendent's Update. I am Joe Lynch for the Media Center. I am so pleased. I have two members of the Somerville School Committee with us today, Ilana Krepchin from Ward 2 and Laura Patone from Ward 5. Good day to both of you. Good day. Hello, Joe and people. Yeah, you're both smiling, so I have to assume it's A, either we're having a good day, or B, you love seeing my face on screen. <laughs> Definitely B. I, I'll take A, because I, I think, you know, every day we assess it in how good of a day we're having. So we're going to get right to it. There are uh, multiple things that I know both um, Laura and Ilana want to chat about, but um, as far as the overview, um, either one, if you want to take it, where are we in terms of um, satisfaction issues still needing to be addressed with virtual learning since we went in September? Either one, Laura or Ilana. I, I, I can get started, Ilana, please chime in. Um, we'll do. The, I, the city, the school committee, and the administration is just working really hard to both deliver high quality remote learning, as well as get our highest priority students in have, having in-person learning experiences as soon as possible. Um, we know that the experience our students are having in the fall is very different from the spring. Anecdotally, I've gotten a lot of positive feedback, um, but there's still a lot of students who are going to struggle because working in an environment where they're on a screen versus in person, is just not gonna meet their needs. Um, so that's that's really challenging um, and very devastating as a school committee member and I think for staff who uh, I want to give kudos to our educators who are working so hard and really getting returned but never going to be able to get the same bang for their buck as they would in person. So that's kind of the general overview. There's a lot of conversation and concern about the criteria for deciding when we do get to return to in-person learning. and um, I think sometimes there's some confusion about where those decisions lie. Um, you know, we as a school committee have already approved the hybrid plan and with the, the responsibility for the buildings don't lie with the school committee, they lie with the city administration and the public health department. So um, making those decisions about whether our buildings are ready to house students and what type of testing, which I really do give a, a pause to the mayor and the mayor's office of having to pass about you know, making sure we have um, buildings that have the right kind of air quality as well as doing testing. But those decisions and those criteria are made by the administration. And I know there's a lot of confusion and a lot of concern about that. And I really encourage people to share that and ask their questions both to the school committee and to um, the mayor. I think he really encourages that. Well, let me bounce it over to Alana. Alana, we are um, unfortunately, the city of Somerville itself as a community has slipped into the red zone uh, as of last week. And simply put, the red zone basically means that our rate of infection is climbing um, and our positivity rates are climbing. And that is something I know that the mayor and the school committee and the council and the board of health and health officials in this city are keeping a very, very close eye on. And I think a lot of people should be aware of the fact that that is an indicator of how we move forward with in-person learning. Ilana, any, uh, I don't mean to put you on the spot and it's a, not a getcha question. Do we have any reports so far of the school age population with, who have been um, diagnosed with COVID? Do we have not to my knowledge, but that is a, probably a better question for the city health department. I'm not sure at this point that we would be privy to that. Um, so not to my knowledge, which isn't to say that it isn't happening, but I think that would be a better question for the health department. Sure. And um, uh, Alana, the last time you were yeah. on the show, we were talking about the constant assessment that's being done as to how well the programs are um, being effectuated across the board for all students. Any update on where you think we are at this point? You know, anecdotal feedback, feedback coming from the students, from the teachers. 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, anecdotally, like Laura was saying, I do feel like overall people are having a more favorable, favorable response to the remote learning that's happening this fall versus the spring. But I think assessment is a really important piece of that. Um, I think it might be too early in the year to really know. Um, I know that my daughter in seventh grade was talking about having a math test and the Spanish test, and it did get me thinking about how you make sure kids aren't cheating if they're in a remote setting. And I don't have an answer to this. It's just something that was on my mind just as of this morning when my, mom, when my daughter told me she had a math test. Not that I was concerned she was cheating per se or that any particular kid is cheating. It just got me wondering how this all works in a remote setting. And I don't have an answer. We haven't actually talked about it at the school committee level. Um, and it may just be too early in the year yet to be talking about the assessments. So I think, I th thanks, Ilan. I think the last time we were chatting about it, they were kind of looking at that second week of November, somewhere in that time frame, second week to into Thanksgiving week, to try to issue some type of an opinion about mm -hmm. what's working, what's not working, mm -hmm. how that will guide going back to in-person learning, whether that's done this year or in January or whenever. Yeah. So, um, I, I want to delve a little bit more into what Laura was saying about the clarity that people, uh, the clear communication of information to the parents and to the students about how these decisions are being made. Obviously, every indicator um, that we have is that the COVID-19 pandemic is not showing any signs of slowing down across the country, here in the Commonwealth, and in Massachusetts, and in Somerville. So that is the guiding principle that the superintendent's office, the school committee, um, the mayor, the health, the health department, all of you are looking at the same, trying to look at the same data, saying let's make the best decision. But if either one wants to take that piece of it, I know the mayor and the president of the city council both serve on your committee. Um, and you met Monday. We did. Right on that one. So if either one wants to take it, how does the city assess whether or not that physical school building is safe enough to bring kids back into? The loaded question, but. Also, you know, I, I don't, Alana, do you want, or do you want me okay. to? I'll just start and she can yeah. chime in as she sees fit, because I'm sure I'll miss some things. Um, so the city has brought in uh, HVACs uh, expertise from the outside to evaluate all the school buildings. And they went through a process that was shared um, during a town hall a few weeks ago that outlined you know, kind of the level, relative risk factors of different buildings and the readiness of each building to bring students back in. And they're looking at things like airflow, so how many times the air is turned over in a period of time, um, filtration, and also um, humidification because I guess there's some um, understanding or research regarding managing humidification can help minimize transmission of the virus. Um, and so they went through that process and now they're going through uh, an emergency, I might not be using the exact words, but kind of an emergency procurement process to bring in potential contractors to come in and improve these buildings. And they've got buckets of buildings, they have a few buildings that are in better shape than others, which are the ones they expect to come online sooner than others. Um, but they're yeah. in that. Um, Laura, is it fair to say that some of our newer schools are yes. much more prepared to? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, and in particular, the high school, um, although the, they're on track in their um, construction process, the expectation is that they're going to be complete with construction early in December. Um, but there's obviously work that has to happen to transition and prepare the building for students to be in. But that building is in the best shape. Uh, the Capuano and the Argenziano, I think were two of the other buildings that were in better shape that had li less work that needed to be done to put them at the level that uh, the city is expecting. Now we're still waiting um, and requests have been made both from constituents, uh, citizens and um, elected officials to say, can you give us more detail about this? Like, what do you mean when a building is ready? What is the expect ex expected performance for those buildings? And so we're, the mayor has offered that they're going to provide that information, but that they're still putting it together. So does that answer your part, question? Yeah, it does. And I think part of that assessment, to be clear for any of the listeners, 
part of that assessment is taking into account the weather that's outside because the CDC and all the other health advisories are saying air circulation is critical. So some of the other buildings, we may not be able to open the windows in the winter time because of the weather outside. Um, so air circulation and air purifying, uh, that's a wrong word, but the uh, safety of the internal air is critical when we go into the winter months. Um, and and we, I think we also have to think about when the ACs in those buildings get turned on. Yep. Um, we have to have safety as a paramount, a, a paramount need. But I do want to glide into, Ilana, when we start mm -hmm. talking about um, or students who have much higher needs, mm -hmm. the in-person taught. Do you want to take that and to, uh, toss it over to Laura? Uh, so uh, your question is just about who, which students we're talking about or how they're, so we're talking about level one English language learners and students with IEPs. Um, and those are the, that's the, the first level that we're talking about getting into the buildings. Um, and what the administration is working on is looking at, okay, if we're going to get this building and this building online first, how are we going to best utilize that building to house the most, the, these students in the most effective ways? Since right now we have programs for different students at different schools, and so it may require moving programming from one school to a different school in order to accommodate the, the highest at risk students in whichever buildings we can get online first. So let me see if I have it straight. We have, uh, we have a community of students who have much higher needs. Correct. For learning. And those students may have been used to going to a certain physical school. And mm -hmm. what we're trying to assess is that if that school cannot accommodate that in-person learning, those students may have to go to another school. That is correct. And that uh, we also have to take into account that some of these high need students their families may not feel comfortable with them coming into the building. So we also, in, in this whole process, have to figure out how to continue to give them as robust a remote learning experience as is possible, even while we're also welcoming as many of them back as we can. Uh, back, Ilana, thanks. Laura, Ilana was mentioning, uh, you know, the high, high needs population within the student community. How are we addressing students who have um, ability needs, not necessarily from a learning curve, but physical ability challenges? Are, are we thinking about bringing those kids with ADA type of um, needs? Absolutely. I mean, part of the first wave. Yeah, that that first population. Um, it's specifically the higher needs students that we. Are really pushing to have be the first population to come in in addition to our level one ELs. So it's not necessarily everyone on IEP for that first wave, but the students that really uh, require a, an appropriate environment that really can only be serviced in person. And so that obviously would take, if they're not going to be necessarily in the building that they, they would traditionally be in, we may need to be making those kind of modifications to whatever classrooms to be able to better to serve those students properly. So it's, it's a complicated operational logistic process um, as opposed to just plopping kids in classrooms. Got it. Not Got to it. mention all the PPE that has to go on top of that and the enhanced safety procedures that are going to go on top of that, which is the work that needs to be done with um, within our educator population and working with them to determine how we're going to do that well. I know we don't want to single out any, um, we don't want to single out any group of caregivers or parents but we do have um, some caregivers and some parents becoming vocal about bringing kids back into the school systems. Um, perhaps they have not seen some of the reports where schools have gone back to in-person learning only to have the infection rate go up and then having to stop that in-person learning. Do we have a sense of what percentage of the caregiver parent population are really pushing for in-person learning? 
Is it 10% of those or? That is a really good question. I'm not sure I have any way to know. I certainly know that the parents who are pushing for that are very vocal. So they tend to be the ones who are coming to school committee meetings and, and having public comment and sending feedback to the school committee. I don't actually know. Laura, Laura do you have any ideas? No, and you know, that's always a challenge as an elected official is that you're trying to represent the whole population of families. And there's always a population of families that have more access and I'm not discrediting them because I do think, um, I will acknowledge that, you know, there's definitely been a push to challenge the position of the administration regarding the building air quality, as well as some questions about how we would do surveillance testing. And I, and I applaud people for asking the questions and asking for information. But I, I think that their requests are very sincere and there are many that are not, that actually acknowledge their own privilege and they say, I don't have my kid in remote. I have a nanny. I have put my kid in a private school, but they're really out there advocating for the general population and saying, we know this is not, we feel like we want to get these kids in the schools as soon as possible. So the challenge is so not so much that I think everybody wants low risk return to in-person learning. There's no question about that. It's the details about what does that look like? What are our expectations? And so that's why people are reaching out and saying, you know, uh, administration, school committee, please answer our questions. Why, why this about the building? Why this level and not that level? Um, and I think that part of the challenge is that this is all happening in real time. It's not like someone sat down for six months and made a beautiful plan and then we're executing it. Everybody's learning as they're going. And, you know, frankly, I'm so appreciative and thankful both for um, the administrators on the school side and the city side that are so well and you know wanting to do the right things as well as the families that are speaking out and are speaking out in such a way that is like we are working together we don't want to fight here we want to figure out how to help make this happen as soon as possible so the details are the hard part though yeah and speaking of you know potential conflicts um so the caregivers there's a certain part of the population of caregivers who want their kids to go back to in learning they're listening, they're learning how the decisions are being made. How about on the teacher side? Do we have a sense of how many of the educators in the city are chomping at the bit to get back into in-person learning? Or are they comfortable now with the virtual learning and willing to let this play out? Uh, I don't have a sense of that. Yeah, Joe, I don't have numbers, but I do know that educators want to advocate for teaching their kids and having relationships with their students and engaging. And there are some that are probably more comfortable, just like in the parent population, there's some that are gonna be more comfortable with the idea of being in person. There's a, a population of them that probably have medical concerns that make them too risky to do that. And, and we will address that because no one's gonna say, you know, you've got a medical condition, we're gonna make you do this. Um, and then we have the people that are in between that wanna have, learn more and have confidence that the district is doing everything they can do so that may sway them either way to decide that they're comfortable or at least willing to take the risks that we're all, I mean, the bottom line is we're all taking risks every single day. Every time I walk out my front door, every time I go to the grocery store, um, people are doing things every day to take risks and, you know, having the confidence in the city that the city is doing the right things to be able to make it as low risk as possible. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad you mentioned the health side of things that we do have a, a segment of the population student population who have underlying conditions and we have to address those um anecdotally i heard a story this week today is wednesday so it was this week about um and not within the somerville public school system but a teenager who had a younger sibling um at home at home learning and the caregiver, the parent, had to teach the teenager how to administer the EpiPen because mm -hmm. the ch this younger child has severe peanut allergy. So that had never been thought of before because while the child was in school, the teachers are trained on that stuff and they know the information about that child. But here's a 14-year-old kid who now has to be taught how to administer an EpiPen because they're at home learning. So the health side of it, I totally get. Just that was glaring to me when, when I'd never thought of it. 
Mm -hmm. So this situation is so devastating behind people's closed doors, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, the fact that we're turning homes into classrooms and work sites all at the same time and expecting so much of everyone, um, it's just, you know, it's just devastating. And, um, you know, the district is aware of this and doing the things in their power to help out. But uh, this pandemic has just really, I, sometimes we, sometimes we forget how devastating this all is. Besides the fact that people are getting sick and dying, which is the other piece that's incredibly devastating. Yeah. So, One of the most heartbreaking things to me, I just remember reading about back in April, and this was not specific to Somerville in any way, but I just remember reading about uh, state reports of domestic violence going way down. And that certainly wasn't because there wasn't domestic violence. It's because the reporting wasn't happening because kids weren't going to school and that is a big place where reporting of that kind of thing happens. Right. And I just, that, that broke my heart to think about. So that's another piece to all of this sort of health separate from the actual virus. You know, I think it just demonstrates once again, the complexity of our education system. Um, I, I do want to talk about, uh, well, one burning question that I was asked the other day was what happens to snow days? So the state has come out. The state has come out and said that districts can now either declare a snow day or they can have remote learning and count it as a regular day. So it will still be within the di each district to make that decision. But districts have the option because they have these now remote plans happening um, to consider it a remote day and count it as a school day. Let me just say, you know, if I was a student, remote learning and there was snow outside, I would expect a snow day. <laughs> well, I'm afraid <laughs> that you might be out of luck, Joe. <laughs> Laura, there was another piece that you wanted to talk about. We have a few minutes left. You wanted to talk about the uh, progress of the high school building. Um, you know, sometimes I have a hard time coming up with the right words, but when I watch either videos or see photos of the high school, I literally swoon a little bit. It is just a stunning building. Um, it's going to be such an incredible resource for our students and staff, as well as our community. I mean, it's really put together to have the cafe that the students are cooking and serving and having these um, meeting spaces and auditoriums. Um, you know, it's been, a, it's been a long slog and it's, it's been a hard process, but um, the light is at the end of the tunnel. Uh, we see that, you know, they're saying, they're saying December. And so, you know, depending on where the virus is, because we always say, you know, there's the three pieces, there's the buildings, there's the virus itself and its progression and the testing, but you know, that there, there can be students possibly in there in, as early as January. So um, I just, you know, we're so immersed in all this hard stuff. I think it's super important to elevate and, and get excited about the new building because it's really such a showpiece. Ilana, I'm always looking for the discussion part of it. Your impressions on progress of the new high school, whether or not they're going to be able to open in December of 21, and uh, how this I is don't going. have any intel beyond what Laura said. Um, fingers crossed for sure. Uh, I've watched some of the same videos Laura has talking about, about the progress, and it's a beautiful building, and it's definitely something you get excited about. So I'm, I'm going with that aspect of it. Um, because no matter when we get in there to use it, it's going to be a great building to use. It's interesting. I did take a walk um, uh, this past weekend, and I walked right by the front and then circled down Walnut Street and mm -hmm. walked by the back and came up on the backside. I will say this. It is a massive addition when you look at it from the Gilman Square area. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm not quite sure that anyone anticipated the massing size of that building when you look at the back side of it. Yeah. Um, Going to be interesting. Well, the other piece, of course, is also kind of the views and the vistas from the inside of the building. They're, they're, they're drop dead beautiful and they really showcase the city and everything it has to offer. I really, I go in and I kind of stop in awe when I'm at the top of the stairs on the back side because I had never really seen that view. And, and in any way, or at least in this huge way. So um, again, it's sort of this connecting building to our community, which is functionally and visually. Ilana, but I agree, it is big. Ilana, have you been inside? I have not. 
Well, I'm looking we'll forward to it, but it hasn't yet. We'll have to get you a tour. Um, so it looks like it is on schedule. Um, one of the other things that is a pressing issue, and it's more from a personal standpoint, because I know that you're both moms, mm -hmm. and you both have kids in the school system, but a major event is coming up, Halloween. I know, I know. Um, what do you think as moms, as educators, and as government officials? Well, I know that the city has come out officially discouraging anything. Um, my daughter at 12 is sort of on the cusp of not really caring anyway. So in my own personal household, I don't think it's going to present a big deal. If she wants to go for a walk with a, f a few friends and look at a few houses, I will be okay with that as long as she's staying away from crowds and wearing a mask. Um, I, my heart breaks for little kids missing out on something so fun. So I do hope people figure out small ways to at least walk around their neighborhood or do something. Um, it does feel like outdoors wearing masks is so much safer than indoor activities and all of that, that um, things on a very small scale within your own neighborhood may be the way to go. Yeah, that's, I, uh, my, I, that's my instinct. I happen to know that Laura Patone and, and her family love dressing up at Halloween because I've seen those pictures. We well, do and um, you know my daughter is planning a very small get together with some of her friends. She's 14. I told her 10 people is the limit. Um, and uh, I, I could imagine that there's probably some neighborhoody things going on. I mean, we cannot have that destination trick or treating that happens on Lexington Ave or on Highland Road. But um, if people are walking around their own neighborhood or they have people are talking about shoots with candies going in the shoot or putting a plate out of candy. Um, but you know, I'll buy my kid her own candy and go from there. It's it's a it's a bummer. Yeah, I asked the question because you know I have my little posse here on the street that I live on, and they're making plans. They're not going to do traditional door to door trick or treating. So, um, and I think I think it was ingenious that the parents here said, "You kids devise what you want to do. You're not going to go door to door." So come up with something that we think is safe and we'll, we'll support it. So it's amazing to see how they're making their own plans. They're not going to be told no trick or treating. They're going to be told you can't go to door to door, but figure out something else. So it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. Um, I don't have any plans on going trick or treating. So the, the Patone Cole household is a safe this year that I won't come knocking at the door, but um, we only have about uh, 10 seconds left. I want to thank you both. Ilana Krepchen, Ward 2 School Committee Rep. Laura Patone, Ward 5 School Committee Rep. Keep up the good fight. We know why you're doing what you're doing. Um, and understanding, clarity, and communication. I know you guys are doing it for the caregivers and the kids of this city. So thank, thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Thank you for everything you do. I am Joe Lynch, Somerville Media Center. As always, thanks for watching. Stay safe, stay informed. See you next time.